my friend John Burdell. John, I, I, I am, you, need, you and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, it, it'll come as no shock when I tell you that I'm compulsive with all things, but uh, especially with biometry. I mean, um, um, you know, the, the, the old adage is measure twice, cut once. That's like, you know, I'm measuring like an order of magnitude more than that. My grandma would be proud. She always said measure twice, cut once. Yeah. Well, okay. So anyway, uh, w however compulsive I, I am, I'm the next level up with torque lenses and torque lens uh, planning and placement and all of that, that stuff. And I am confident with my, uh, my surgical planning. And I, you know, I've had patients, uh, not a lot, but I've had patients for whom I'm telling you, I will, I will swear on whatever you want that I did everything perfectly. And when I left that eye, the lens was in the right place. And they come in postoperatively, and there's residual cylinder. Sometimes the lens is still in the in the right place, and there's some funky biometry ELP lens tilting. Who the hell knows what's going on? issue, although I have to fix it or not. And sometimes, despite my best efforts, the lens has rotated. So this is the clinical context in which you give a, a wonderful presentation. Where, where do we go from here? Yeah, so the first place we start is we can fix it. We can almost always fix it. And there's a number of different ways that we can fix it. So, so good job being compulsive both preoperatively and intraoperatively. And there's some things that are beyond your control. One is if the lens rotates. Maybe we can make sure we remove all the viscoelastic, tamp it down, allow the haptics to unfold, give us a little higher likelihood that the lens will stay in place. Um, but uh, sometimes it'll still rotate. And um, sometimes the prediction that we did on the front end isn't as good. Now down the road there's some exciting things coming with light adjustable lens. We're using that in our practice now and that mitigates a really? lot of these factors. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Mitigating a lot of these factors not widely available yet. But what do you do when those things happen? Okay? So if um, so, so one example is using astigmatism fix free website um, that's available to help you calculate if you can rotate the lens. And, and if you can rotate it and the spherical equivalent is good and you'd be happy with that, and the reduction in astigmatism is adequate, then rotating a lens is a good option. If not, perhaps a laser enhancement, an AK, or an IOL exchange. But we can almost always fix it. And so I start there. And so don't beat yourself up too much. Uh, you know, it happens to all of us. A lot of data goes into astigmatism fix, you know, every month from surgeons that are facing the same thing that has happened to you rarely. And your compulsion is decreasing the rate that it happens to you. Okay, so I have a whole bunch of, of questions here. Uh, one question is, when do I pull the trigger? When, you know, when postoperatively do I say, this is not getting better and I have to do something? Yeah, um, if you clearly see a lens is rotated, it's not going to just rotate back to the yeah. position you wanted it to be at. So if it's at one week and it's clearly rotated, I'd go back in early. And, and at a week, and I have on my own patients, because it happens to me too, and rotate it back into position. <clears throat> now, the question is, should you rotate it to the original planned position, or do you use now the manifest refraction to, to dictate that? And that's a little saying. bit of a judgment call at one week, because they may not be refractively stable. But if you get a really solid refraction, I'm looking to see if that's a little bit different than what the original planning said. But this is interesting. I, I have, I've never been in that circumstance. Uh, I, I mean, it's when I've had to go back in, the the recommendation has been within you know a, a, a the hair's breadth of of the the original planning. But that's interesting. That that uh, so how how do you how do you reconcile when they are yeah. different? So yeah, good question. So if I know that it's the rotation issue, we're usually right in our planning, and so if it rotated say 30 degrees, go back in right away and change it. Um, but but. It's better to use the refraction because this is how it works you, w you know with the IOL rotation astigmatism fix we take the refraction we know what the toric lens is and where it's at and from the refraction we can subtract that out and figure out the idealized astigmatic state of the eye and then we can back calculate 
where would the lens be? So if you got a surprising surgically induced astigmatism or the posterior corneal curvature was um, steeper than maybe we anticipated from Graham Barrett's we're great just, we're, formula. We're just using averages with Th that. That's yeah. right. So, so then you can actually get the final common pathway we all care about, which is the refraction yeah. to back calculate where to put the lens. And so in general, that's what I do. So uh, I, I am not going to ask you uh, what can be done during the original surgery to minimize the likelihood, to, we think, minimize the likelihood of rotation of the lens. But what I am going to ask you is, if I have to go back in and rotate this lens, what can I do to minimize the likelihood that it's going to re-rotate back? Good question. I'm going to not answer the question that you asked me. And I'm going to answer something different first, and then I'll come back to that. First thing is, uh, you don't make, need to make a 6 o'clock mark when you come back. Okay? You've got a great mark where those oh, dots yeah, the are already. So the too. way to do that is to mark where the lens is currently and then how many degrees to rotate from there. Mm -hmm. And then you've got it solid on and you don't have to worry about misalignment. Then the question about what do you do to make sure it doesn't rotate again doesn't have a lot of great data about it. There's some data out there that suggests, uh, in peer-reviewed literature, that suggests putting in a CTR that helps. Catch ring, yeah. it's, it's small. It's loose uh, data, but there is some data to suggest that. You could also do a reverse optic capture, where you put the optic on top of the capsule, and that'll lock it in. Um, and, and a lot of times, just rotating it back to the right place, removing all the viscoelastic, yeah. the bag has started to shrink down yeah. a little bit, so it's not so wide open. So most of the time, I don't think that you need to do anything other than make sure it's in the right place. Do you, do you put in capsule tension rings in, in this setting? I do not. Yeah, OK. I've done both. Um, I don't have any thoughts about it. So okay, so so that is one avenue uh, for 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 amelioration. Uh, what about these other choices? When? How do you decide uh, that uh, laser vision correction is the best choice? Uh, a couple of things. First, what's the spherical equivalent? Because if we're off on spherical equivalent. You can rotate that lens anywhere you want to, but you're not changing the spherical equivalent. So mm -hmm. spherical equivalent has to be right. Second is, you know, did this lens happen to have weak zonules, or is it aggressively fibrosing, or something like that that would make me say, I don't want to go back into the eye, and then move towards laser vision correction. Um, of course, if you're going to do laser vision correction, you have to have access to an eczema. So do you have an eczema in your practice, or do you have a relationship with someone that would enhance a patient like this for you? If not, then you're looking at an IOL exchange or, or rotating or the toric or, um, or a pair of glasses. Yeah, I mean, always, always an option, right? Although the patient has shelled out for a, for a premium lens and, and, and wants some ROI. Which is, which is what we want to try and avoid, because our original goal was trying to help them minimize their need for glasses. OK. So. There, there's uh, there's an important there, there there's an elephant in the room here, right? So we've uh, made our assessment. We've come up with our plan. We know what we would like to do. How do we talk to the patient about it? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing that <laughs> patients don't care what you know until they know that you care. So the first thing to do is demonstrate that you actually do care and actually care. Hey, we're gonna be able to. This. I'm sorry that there's a bump in the road. This does happen sometimes, but we can fix it. In our practice, we include the cost of fixing it in the upfront fee, so we're just talking to the patient about what we're going to do at no cost to them to help fix the situation that we're in. And I find that patients, although disappointed and usually say something like, God, this always happens to me, um, they're reasonable about it. And as long as they know that you're competent and that you care, we'll get them to a good spot. And it's really helpful that they don't have to pay an extra fee for it. Right, and I, I've, I've always found, I mean, again, it hasn't happened a lot, I'm grateful to say, but I've always found that I'm more anxious in anticipation of that conversation than the patient is about the conversation. That's right. Because they know that the outcome isn't what they want, and they're happy to hear that, that you want to do something about it. Exactly right. And so, so, especially if you have the confidence that you know you can fix it, which you usually can, they, uh, they connect with us on that confidence. They say, ah, Josh knows what he's doing. He'll get me where I, where I need to go. And yeah, this wasn't ideal, but it'll be okay. Yeah. 
so that that's 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 great. And, and, and you know, we we could end the conversation here, and this would have been a, a fulfilling experience for me, John. But let me let me just ask you this. So, um, and maybe you don't have a go-to answer for it. But uh, this has happened with the patient's first eye. You're going to put a torque lens in the in the second eye. Is there anything that you do to modify technique with the second eye if you've already had an experience about getting burnt with the first? You know, I really don't, probably because I'm meticulous on the first eye about removing viscoelastic, making sure the... Wait, there's nothing more. Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't know that, I don't know that there's something more that I can maybe saying to the patient, hey, this happened in the first eye, there's probably a little higher likelihood that it that's, could happen I, that's, in the next. That's, that's what I next. do. It's and never happened with the second eye with yeah, me. I, but, haven't, yeah. I haven't had that either. And interestingly, in, in the studies that we've published that have come out of astigmatism fix, some of the things that are surprising, like we did not see a higher rotation rate in high myopes, even though we all I know that's, that's, believe that's, that's, that's the, the yeah. case. But we didn't see that in the data, and it makes sense to me that it would, but we didn't see it. Yeah, really, really, really interesting stuff. John, I'm so happy that that that, that you that you 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 brought this to us. There are, there are I am told, and I mean that seriously. I am told that there are uh, there's a, a large segment of the membership who are still not putting torque lenses, right? And there are two big barriers to it. Well, there are three big barriers, right? One is is that people get set in their ways and they don't want to change. Fine, what whatever. Ophthalmologists are usually not like that. Uh, second one is, is that there are people who are not used to talking about out-of-pocket fees to the patient, but because there are so many things now that are becoming out-of-pocket, I think there are more patients, more, more people who are comfortable with it. But the third thing is, is that no one wants to do anything in which they're going to have to deal with a, a, um, a post-operative management that can involve a second surgery, and it's just nice to, it's nice to have this conversation in which you don't appear anxious, because you know that this is a situation that, that you can handle, and it's, it's you know, the re-rotations are not that difficult, and um, I think it's just good for people who are viewing this who are not yet doing toric lenses, um, you can handle this, you know? I, I, I totally agree, and I, I think your assessment is spot on. Behavior change, uncomfortable talking about money, and unclear about an exit plan if we have an unhappy situation. And, and it's pretty easy with toric lenses to have an exit strategy that can fix the problems that may arise, even though they arise infrequently. Yeah. John, this is great. Uh, look, I want to thank you as always for, for uh, br bringing in an interesting topic, for making it very, very clear. You're an uh, articulate and elegant guy, so it's easy speaking with you. And uh, I, I want to thank you for being so very generous with your time with me today. Thanks, Josh, and thanks for all you do for education for all of us. Thanks.